Welcome to Apex Magazine. Strange, surreal, shocking, beautiful. Hello and welcome to the Apex Magazine podcast. I'm your host and producer, KT Brisky. Welcome back to the show. Today is a special bonus episode for you. We recently held the second edition of our editor Q&A event. So join Jason Sizemore, Leslie Connor, and Maurice Broadus as they answer author questions, hosted by Beth Dawkins. And be sure to check out the Apex Magazine Kickstarter page as well. We have a whole bunch of great rewards, some nifty add-ons, and some really, really neat stretch goals should we fund. That Kickstarter runs until August 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern. So sit back, relax, and let's have a listen to the Apex Magazine Editors. Hello and welcome to Apex Q&A. Um, I hope I hit my mark. Um, I'm Beth Dawkins here with Jason, Maurice, and Leslie. Um, and we are Hello and welcome answer, to well, Apex. They are going to answer some of your questions. Um, let's start it off. Y'all ready? Yes. Yes. First, how about y'all... Each one of you introduce yourselves. Um, who wants to go first? First question. Okay, Maurice has already dropped out. That didn't take long. <laughs> Hopefully he pops back up. Yeah, he's probably got technical issues. So I, I can go first. I'm Jason Sizemore. Um, I have a titanium jaw, which makes me um, cyborg and partial superhero. I am the editor-in-chief of Apex Magazine, and I look forward to answering all your questions. Um, I am Leslie Connor. I am the managing editor at Apex Magazine. Um, and beyond that, I'm not nearly as interesting as Jason. I don't have a titanium job. You could talk <laughs> all about the real job here. All right. Um, should we give Maurice a minute before we start questions or no? Oh. We have a Welcome change of location. <laughs> Welcome back, Maurice. We um we just did introductions. If you want to go ahead. Oh, uh yeah, Maurice brought us. Yeah, I got nothing. I'm an author, <laughs> editor. Uh, invader of my son's room and now he's upset with me uh, because it's, this has the best internet location and I'm on the air. I just came to get my laptop. I appreciate you. <laughs> and father of two. <laughs> what do you do for Apex? Oh, yeah, and I do stuff for Apex. <laughs> um... Look here. It's, it's been a long day. It's been a long day. So y'all head to this live yeah, stream and the, the evening. And the sun is giving you gr guff and I understand. Right, right. Uh, so I'm an editor at Apex. I think I do like reprints and stuff. I no, I'm a special no. editor. I'm a special editor. Wait, what do I do? You're special fiction editor. I'm special fiction editor. You do reprints. And then whatever else I feel like doing. And you send me uh, original fiction from writers that you think deserve the attention or have a story that deserves the attention. Yeah. Yeah, I do all that. Yeah. This is what I do. I like to keep a, a vague a vague job description because that actually lowers my work commitment. So uh, I can pretty much define my job as what I feel like doing that month. As you can see, Beth, uh, we're a finely honed team. We run a tight ship. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's fun to work with friends, and it seems like Apex has a very warm and friendly atmosphere behind it, for sure. As somebody that has sold work to Apex, I think this is a very, very true statement. All right. Y'all want to get to questions? 
So. Sure, let's go. All right. So let's start but with question number one. Why was I the only one to wear an Apex shirt for this thing? This is really bending me out of shape. I look oh, at I was, re- I was no, late what? showing up to this thing. All I'm right. My Ape- I'm drinking on my Apex mug. I'm <laughs> doing Apex shots. I almost got an Apex shot, but it was not going to be large enough for what I felt like doing tonight. So. Should we make a rule for Jason's shots? Like every time when he says something. <laughs> every time Maurice complains about something, Jason should take a shot. There we go. Uh, this will be empty in about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll really get into the good questions. Jason will be on the floor. Maurice and I are like, I guess we're taking over. <laughs> All part of our long-term plan. That's right. All right. Um, let's see. Let's start. This says it's a fun question. So a new mandate limits you to only one form of potato the rest of your life. How are you preparing those spuds? <laughs> I think I know who sent this one. I, yeah, I think I do too. <laughs> Okay, well, first I will use a uh, potato peeler, one of those knuckle busters that uh, I'm very skilled with, you know, like, and then I dice the potatoes, put some um, vegetable oil in a pan, heat it, let it get hot, dump the potatoes in, Garnish with some herbs and, and some then I dice the potatoes and I'm then French fries. That's my answer. I'm keeping French a, fries. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm probably going with the uh, mashed potatoes, although my mashed potatoes usually involve lots of butter, um, sour cream, at least three kinds of cheeses, you know, that sort of thing. That's the king's bud right there. There you go. Maurice, do you add milk or cream to yours? I do not. Mostly because of how many, well, I mean, I add cream, cream at least three as one of my cheeses. <laughs> so I don't know if that counts. So with this question, does it have a background to it? Um, there are a lot of potatoes going around on the Apex Discord. That is a hot topic of conversation. <laughs> we play hot potato with that topic. Why, Jason? <laughs> Why are we doing this? I'm done. Good night, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) All right. If you think back over your time at Apex Magazine, what were a few of the stories that you remember being most proud of the magazine publishing, original or reprint? Mm. I think it means both original and Mm -hmm. reprint. Oh, my God. Uh, Mm. Even though he's... He's sitting right there. I'm going to say Pimp My Airship. I think it was in our second issue. Yep. Uh, It was just so groundbreaking and um, just so damn entertaining and fun. Also with a very vibrant socio-political message. And here I am years later, and I still think about that story all the time, not just because I published the novelization of it, but just the fact that it um, kind of predated a lot of the current awesome um, fiction that we are seeing from um, writers of color and um, international fiction. So well done, Maurice. I, applaud you yet again oh, uh, thank you I, I have a reprint that I'm very proud of um, each thing I show you is a piece of my death by Gemma Files and Stephen uh, Barrister Barrister apologies Stephen I always miss you mess up your last name but it's this wonderful meta piece about um, uh, a cursed video and I I don't know if it or like uh, that awful VHS series 
uh, movies came out first, but Gemma's story is, is so wonderful, and it, it continues to be by far our most popular reprint. All right, I'm done. You're done. I could talk. Uh, I could answer this question all night. So. I would just say anytime that we um, published a new author and it's their first sale or their first pro sale, that is super exciting because I know they're super excited and it just makes me really super happy for them. So, and I know we've done a lot of those over the years and I get really excited every time it happens. Let's see, my favorite, oh goodness. You know, you had to say Cheshire Burks. You know what? I was like, so <laughs> rather, rather than just say, say she toy, uh, which was, uh, uh, which was Cheshire, you know, that was a, a landmark uh, story by Cheshire. Uh, I'm go, oh, man, that is one of my favorites. I gotta lie. That, that was one of my favorites. In fact, so, I, so I'm kind of torn because there were like two, all right, I'm torn over my two guest issues of Apex is actually what I'm torn over. Um, and so it, there was the, the issue that and it had the Say She toy in it, and it had a, oh, and it had Walter Mosley in it, um, which was uh, the, the fruition or completion of, uh, I don't know, he was such a huge influence on me as a writer, and so to turn around and be able to publish a, a short story of his was huge. Um, but then also the Afrofuturism issue that had, like, Stephen Barnes and Tanana Reeve Du and, and, and Tobias Buckell and uh, and LaShawn Wilnick, uh yeah, those would be the, the two pieces for me. The, the, of course, it still seems self-serving. The two issues I edited, I really loved out of Apex. So It's fine. Uh, okay. I think that's actually uh, normal. I'm, I'm glad that the stories that you selected are ones that left Mark with. <laughs> that I enjoyed. Well, there, there you go. We would, we would all hope so, I think. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, when you consider the format of snap judgment versus the actual submission process, would you be more likely to give a story with a slower, less effective opening a chance if it came to you as a second or third round? So before, before this, um, to anybody that hasn't seen the snap judgment, do y'all want to explain a little about that? Yeah. Uh, so basically, you have a panel of editors. It was Leslie, myself, and Mike Allen. And for future snap judgments, that third person will be a rotating series of different guests. Um, the person who is hosting, uh, it was Andrea Johnson last time. She reads the first 250 words of a short story, and we give our uh, take on that first 250 whether there was a point in the story that we would stop reading and immediately reject it, or if we would keep reading with caveat, you know, like it is starting a little slow, but there were certain aspects that kept us interested enough to keep reading. All right, so to answer that question, yes. Uh, if a story has made it up to past our slush team i am more likely to give it a longer read uh because i trust my uh editorial team and leslie uh marisi no i trust marisi too and uh so anything that's from the slush or from the from a slush editor or leslie since Leslie's my managing editor, anything she sends me gets a heck of a lot more leeway, just in general, because she and I have been working together for so long. Same with Maurice. Um, so yes, the answer to that is yes. All right. Leslie, did you want to add anything to it? Um, I can say that I do think that in most cases, I do read beyond 250 words um, because I'm reading everything that's been recommended from the slush team. Um, but sometimes you're, you're going, all right, guys, 
when is it <laughs> going to pick up? When am I going to know what the story is? That's where you start to, if I'm trying, if we're like 250, 300 words in, and I'm still trying to figure out what the story is, then that's when you do start to lose me. I am a walking snap judgment, so this is probably not the best arena for me. <laughs> Maurice is like, no, reject. We're no. Not. <laughs> but, but part of that, well, I mean, that is true. I got a lot of that. <laughs> It's true. But I mean, part of it is after about 250, 300 words, it's not even about the story per se. It's about whether or not you've uh, made me feel like I'm in good hands. So even with a slow burn or something like that, it, with, with 250 words, I'm going to know if I'm in good hands or not. And if I'm in good hands, I'm, I'm going to trust trust the storyteller. But if I'm if, if after 250 words, if I have that, mm -mm, I'll bail because it doesn't take me long to know if I'm in good hands. Maurice, would you call that uh, a part of the suspension of disbelief? No, it, it's more about... All right, so there was a story, I think it was in Dark Faith. Oh, yeah, it was the lead story in Dark Faith 2, the, 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 the second Dark Faith anthology. Um, and it was by um, Tom Piccarelli. And it's a weird story. I mean, it's about a dude who takes up rent in God's head, you know, as one does. Um, but within a paragraph, you know that you're in good hands. It's like this story can go any which way it wants. I'm along for the ride because I know within that first paragraph or two, oh man, I don't know where this is going, but I, I trust this writer to take me wherever they want to go. Um, so it's not quite suspension of, of disbelief. It's more of a, I, I, I'm, I'm sold into the story. Wherever you're going, I'm, I'm you, you've got my, you've got me. Okay, I've got a follow-up question for you, Maurice. Are you to Wait, why am I getting follow-up questions? <laughs> well, because I know how Jason and I's process for the magazine works. Everything that I read has come through the flush pile past our first readers. Mm -hmm. So we've already got one level of reader in there. So then every almost everything Jason reads has come from the slush pile to me up to him. So he's got two levels of readers. Are you reading with a level of reader below you? Or are you reading just off the top of the slush pile? Because that does make a difference. Yeah, um, actually, I, I very rarely dip my toe into the slush pile. I'm, I'm trolling all sorts of other places. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't even tell you how stories find me. Um, so but it's, I, <clears throat> that's what I'm saying is like, yeah. we've already got this whole base of people who some of them have been reading for us for years. And, um, you know, so we already know, like, that we can trust their judgment if they've bumped it up to me. All um, so I was just wondering, like, if you don't have that, I don't know, that starting place, it does make a difference on how you're reading it. Yeah. And frankly, it should be a caution to writers that, if they're handing me stories, it hasn't gone through a process, so it is going to get a snap judgment out of me. <laughs> so, so be warned, if you feel the need to send me a story directly, uh, you're taking your, you know, taking things into your own hands, because I'm only giving you 250 or so. Like, ah, I got stuff to do. So keep that in mind. And like, I'm the, I got stuff to do. And if you ain't got me in 250 words, I'm moving on, so. Yeah. And so send stuff to the slush pile. Give me less work. Yeah. That won't happen. But Maurice makes a good point that... I mean, I could give him half my stack. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> I will take this shirt off mid-interview. <laughs> We're starting a rift. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying, if he wants to have some that's gone through the slush readers, I've got a whole stack of them. I'm good. I'm good. Um... I see that there was a question that popped up, but I believe Jason had answered it in the chat um, that I felt connected, which was um, how big the slush team was. Um, and I know you've already answered it, but I do feel like it's connected to what we're talking about. And is a curiosity even I have? I don't I don't know how big Apex's slush team is. I think we have about 20 readers right now. How many? I think it's about 20, right? Jason? Yeah, 
Yeah, I answered 15 to 20, and usually about half of those are active. So what happens is is a slush reader will come in and do like 20, 30, 40 stories, just bam, 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 and then they're gone for, you know, three weeks. And well, they've got lives outside of reading slush. Exactly. So uh, this is one of the reasons that it's so important that we have low turnover because over time we do get this sense of what is um, an apex story um, in the slush editor pool. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and this relates to one of these questions that was my favorite uh, that came up. What pushes a story from yes to hell yes? Um, if you can make me cry, and I think I have a chance of making Jason cry, hell yes, I'm sending it up. Like, that is, like, my goal in life, is to just be, like, like, I want to just be watching him as he's reading the story to see if he's trying to cover up the tears. Like, that's <laughs> my goal. I want to make Jason cry, because I'm a really good friend. <laughs> so, I, I guess what our audience would like to know, Jason, is what makes you cry? Hmm. Not a whole lot. Usually he's like, why were you crying? Hey, hey, no, no, no. Hey, this, Jason, ignore her. This is a safe place. Be vulnerable, Jason. <laughs> yourself up. I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm trying to remember a story that made me cry, and I'm having it's a hard happened. I know it has happened. You've told me. <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah. Which story was I it? I don't remember. I just remember it was one of those ones that I was like, you need to stop everything you're doing right now and read the story I just sent you. And then I just waited and refused to work until you were done. I came, I remember coming close to crying with Jennifer Pellin's uh, Ghosts of New York. Hey, you stole my answer. <laughs> All right, it's all right. I got another one. I got a backup answer. Okay. Go ahead. No, ruin it, go, but go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, that one hit hard. Uh, go ahead and share yours, Marie, so I'll dig around in my brain for another. Okay. So, because Ghost of New York was going to be one that I, I was uh, going to say. And, and for me, it's not a crying moment. It's like a, a high five moment. At what point do I want to just high five either the author or Jason? Or I got high five somebody, you know, one of those things. Uh, and so, so Ghost of New York was was one, and then uh, Cherie Renee Thomas's most recent story. Uh, that that was that was another one where I mean I, I was ready to high five someone. I think I was like two sentences in. Like I said, I'm a snap judgment person. I was two sentences in. I'm like, yeah, we're gonna buy the story, and Jason's like, you at least have to read the whole story. And I'm like, okay, but. <laughs> I'm a snap judgment person, and I can tell you after two, three sentences, oh, I already feel good about this. One of the best opening paragraphs I flat out ever read. Right, right, and uh, and, and that was it. And so then, by the time I got to the end of the story, I'm like, oh yeah, we're buying the story. And then Jason was like, can I at least have a chance to read it? And I'm like, and then like Leslie, I'm like, okay, but I ain't doing nothing else till you're done. <laughs> so. This is how things work here, you guys. Maurice and I find stories we love, and then we just stare at Jason until he reads them. Right. Yeah. So maybe that's the standard. What causes us to quit working? There you go. Um, the, the chat pointed out one story. Uh, Adam Shannon's um, On the Day You Spend Forever With Your Dog. That one's a rough one. Oh, that my gosh. That rough. I, I'm... I'm a sucker for pet stories, and when I was a kid, you know, Old Yeller and Redfern Grows, you know, always had me bawling, and and that's kind of in the same vein. Um, thanks for mentioning that, Mike Baldwin. Now, <laughs> be depressed. now you're going to get all the dead dog stories. <laughs> All well, right. The talking animal stories, because that's usually my big go to move. Like, if it has a talking animal in it, yeah, it's probably getting a second read out of me. <laughs> All right. What, 
If a slush reader rejects a story, does the rejection come from them? Is there a way for a writer to know whether they made it to that second level? I send an email. If you get past the slush readers, you get an email that says that they've that we're holding it for further consideration. So if you don't get that email, you didn't make it up to my pile. And then if you get, then I send another email. If I've read it and I'm bumping it up to Jason, I send a, another email. So you know all the way through where it is. I didn't set up another question automatically. So there was an awkward pause. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, I sent an email, answered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, that is pretty. All right. Um, what were your immediate reactions when the Apex, the Apex Kickstarter funded? And how do you plan to celebrate when it comes to a close? What extra celebratory awesomeness will be involved if all the stretch goals are met? Oh, wow. Uh, I think... Leslie and I squeed at one another over t uh, text message for a good 15 minutes. Yeah. Like, praise the Lord. <laughs> we get to do more issues. Yeah. Uh, now, if we hit all our stretch goals, uh, man, I, I just think just like the bubbling excitement uh, because we're doing a uh, one of the stretch goals that that's really important to me is the Asian and Pacific Islander issue. Um, and the, the goal after that one is having uh, drop art accompanying all their stories. I just think it would just art. I just love, you know, reading stories that are illustrated and um, being able to say if your work is published with us you're going to have an illustration uh that just for readers and for writers i can see that being very exciting and as for the editor and publisher it, it fills me with um give me give me the money so i can make it happen All right, so are y'all going to do any kind of special celebratory thing for yourselves? Like, are, are we going to have another Q&A that's just like a little party? Or what are we doing, guys? We'll probably celebrate at Worldcon. Yeah. If Worldcon happens. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what we'll do. And, you know, we'll celebrate and everyone will be invited to come Um Join us in the joyous occasion. That's yeah. right. It's been a while since we've had an Apex party that's been shut down by a convention. <laughs> <laughs> My follow-up question to that is, uh, when's the last time that happened? I'm not taking any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the juicy stuff. No, but... Um, <laughs> I was it 2008? 2009? I think it was 2008, wasn't it? That one was shut down hard. Wait, I'm not taking any more follow-up questions. You're right. I'm <laughs> uh, there's been a couple more. There were a couple. Yeah. There, were, there were a couple. That were. <laughs> so I have a lot of questions um, that revolve around the pandemic. Um, a lot of them, um, like, one of them is um, if you found that you read more during the pandemic. Um, or how it changed your reading habits? I would say that I did read more. I read like 165 books last year. Um, but I reread a lot. I, I, I went back and reread old favorites. Like I, I re, I, and stuff that is very fluffy, nothing that took a whole lot of headspace. Like I reread the entire Sookie Stackhouse series. I reread the entire Meredith Gentry series. Um, I reread The Stand because I hate myself. But um, so I, I think I did read more because normally I read about 100 books in a year. So 165 is significantly more. 
Well, there was <laughs> nothing. You couldn't really go anywhere. So. No, I couldn't go anywhere, and all my Girl Scout stuff got canceled, so I stayed home and read. You're always telling me, I wish I could get out of this event so I could just sit here and read. And uh, Now he's revealing the real secrets. <laughs> Don't tell people that. I love my Girl Scouts and the fact that I usually have events, multiple events every single weekend. Yeah, it's it's it wasn't the Girl Scouts. No, no it's just the overscheduling. Right. I read less, but wrote significantly more, we'll say. Significantly more. I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I... I, I it, I know some of my friends just could not write at all, and that I come across as callous. <laughs> right? So, but yeah, I wrote a whole lot. I read less and edited a heck of a whole lot more. I did a lot more freelancing, um, taught a lot more classes online. I just found that reading at times could be a challenge with all the stress that was going on. But I did read some good stuff. I somehow got out of my questions. <laughs> Here's a question from Michael Baldwin. How much networking goes on with editors from other magazines? Yeah, that's the one that I was about to say. <laughs> I got you back. Um, I'll be honest, I'm very horrible about out networking. <laughs> I have really bad social anxiety, so you see me at conventions, and if I don't say hi to you, it's not that I don't want to say hi to you. It's because I'm like, they're not going to know who I am, and then I just shut down so uh i don't do very good at networking i'm really bad at it so i am the exact opposite of leslie <laughs> and Everyone so if I'm, well there's that and so if there's an editor out there and i'm at a convention oh guaranteed at some point during that con we'll be chatting well there's a secret cabal of editors that i'm a part of uh I'm probably going to, you know, be punished for bringing it up. I am flat out lying. Um, <laughs> there is no football that I know That's about. Tougher, Jason. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the editors do all chat with one another quite often. Um, I'm, I think I have really good relationships with most and there's a lot of like hey you know what should I do about this situation or what would you do in that situation going on um, most of the editors are all very sweet nice people mm -hmm. which I, I'm sure comes as a shock to most um, Yeah, uh, that's all I can say without getting in danger. What is the hardest part of running a magazine? Having chuckleheads always at your neck. What define chuckleheads? Yeah, you better. Yeah, define <laughs> chuckleheads. <laughs> no, I, yeah, that was just the bar bit, Leslie and Maurice. Mm. Uh, uh, the hardest part, that was the question, right? Um, God, uh, just the constant, all the uh, plates you had to keep spinning. Oh, yeah, I agree completely. Because you think I'm going to get caught up. I've been thinking that for 10 years. <laughs> like, you just never get caught up. It's a continuous, steady turning of work. And I love it. But sometimes you're like, is there an end in sight? But then you realize, no, there is no end in sight because we do this every other month. So That runs me into 
a question, um, a different question. It's a little bit older is, um, is there a particular story that got you into this? Like the story that hooked you, um, for not only producing stories, but that brought you into the speculative world per se. Uh, that's hard to answer when you <laughs> make a zillion stories. <laughs> uh, probably for me, I know this is rote, but it would probably be something about Stephen King, like uh, The Long Walk. That had a profound effect on me the first time I read it and made me want to do something like Stephen King did, you know, um, create this intense imaginative scenario where you're just playing the reader's emotions, you know, like a violin. I don't know that there's one particular story that got me into speculative fiction or anything. I mean, um, I can say reading Jennifer Pellin's collection, Unwelcome Bodies, is kind of what got me into wanting to work with Apex and wanting to read everything that Apex did. I absolutely, I bought that collection at a convention many years ago, and I loved it, and I just wanted more and more and more. So that's how I kind of came to want to be part of Apex and everything. But as far as um, what kind of got me into speculative fiction and stuff. I, I can't really point to one. My dog is going to decide to be very loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Speculative fiction. I don't know. It was, <laughs> oddly, I'm, I'm torn because I, I fell in love with like Edgar Allan Poe in high school. If you can picture me as like a goth, moody, sort of nerdy kid in high school, that would be me. Uh, oh, like a sinister minister type of Right, right. With with all of the with all of the dark emotions. Mm -hmm. um, but then, uh, but then I would after that I would point to probably Neil Gaiman's Sandman run. That that really sort of hooked me into. I was like, ooh, this is, oh, the power of story is huge. Um, and, and so that that was probably the thing that got me really connected to the whole idea of story. Um, I'm trying to think what. There was with Apex. I, I'd have to think about what it was with Apex in particular that drew me in, but I think it was an acceptance letter. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, I love all things Apex. So, you know. all right. Um, what is on your Apex wish list? For example, something you love to do or offer? Dark Phase Three. I mean, something. Oh, wait, that was. <laughs> Whew, got something caught my throat. My bad. I'm sorry, Leslie, Jason. Did you have an answer? I'm sorry. I blinked out. I did not hear. <laughs> uh, the wish list. Um, Leslie, do you have anything? I mean, right now I'm gonna t think super short term. I would love to get the rest of next year funded through the Kickstarter. Like I know that's super short term, but right now that's where my head is. Like, like right now that's what I'm thinking about. Um, beyond that, I mean, I just want to keep being able to find amazing stories and publishing them and bringing them to our readers. So. I, I do have a short list of writers that I would love to publish in the magazine. Um, one of those is actually one of the featured writers for the Kickstarter, and that, um, that's Gabino Iglesias. Uh, I'm a big fan of his and an admirer. Um, but I don't really want to be dropping the names because, you know, they uh, most likely would never hear it. And never send me anything anyway. So uh, I have certain website improvements in mind. Um, one thing I still want to do is have some kind of really fancy 
cover art gallery kind of thing, like an immersive 3D experience. Uh, I have no idea how, to, how I would pull that off. Um, if I ever came across a pot of gold, I could pay a savvy web developer web developer to do that for me. Um, as far as anything else, though, um, just to continue to find great fiction, get this Kickstarter funded so that you know I can stop stressing about that and um, keep publishing great fiction. Themes and concepts that you see too much of in the slush or i guess well the the slush you leslie you said the slush doesn't come up past to you right yeah i um read everything that the first readers recommend and then i weed that down and recommend things up to jason um lately and and i don't need, i don't want to say so I don't want to say I see too much of it, but I feel like I'm seeing a lot of stories about like the earth has been devastated by climate change. So there's some sort of space station. I don't even want to say a generation ship, but usually it's like a space station that's off of earth. Um, that's struggling because they had to put it up there really fast because we had to get off of the earth. Um, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of those. Like it's like a struggling space station um, or they're on another. Yeah, I just feel like it, a lot of climate. Fi and I don't want to say I'm not even saying I'm seeing too much. I just feel like I'm seeing a lot. And it, I think it's on everyone's mind, is I guess the way to put it. It's on everyone's mind, so I feel like we're seeing a lot of it, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the first thing that came to mind that I'm like, oh, yeah, I've read a whole bunch of those this week. <laughs> All right. Um, did, did submissions go up during the pandemic? Back to the pandemic. <laughs> Well, we reopened from the hiatus after the pandemic, and um, that first few months, we had what well over 2,000 submissions a month for the first few months that we were open. I mean, it was a massive, massive amount. Um, and I'm not sure if that has anything to do with the pandemic more so than it has that we'd been closed, and so people hadn't been able to submit for us, to us for a while, so they were like, ooh, throw everything towards Apex. Um, it has slowed down some, but we still get more than a thousand submissions every month. Um, you know, yeah, when we close, cause we always close in December to get caught up. And um, so January, we always have more submissions in January than those times of year. All right, so getting away from the pandemic, I'm going to ask a funner question. Um, if someone invented a device that would allow you to commission a story for Apex from a currently deceased author, whose work would you be asking for? So I guess it's not super happier, <laughs> but fun in the way that you might get a dream story from a favorite author. Hmm. I figured you you would have one right on the tip of your tongue, Maurice. I'm trying to, well, I'm I'm going through my Rolodex of dead people right now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the way I worded it did like, not make it sound fun. Still alive, or? I mean, I'd love to get a Toni Morrison story. How's that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I had to answer that one. What? I don't think uh, I can top that. Yeah, you might have just shut it down right there. Yeah. Ah, good. My job here is done. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, do you have one? Um, I mean, it's not Tony Morrison, but um, JF Gonzalez was my writing mentor, and I would have loved 
to have been able to work with him and publish one of his stories in the magazine. Um, so, I mean, that's always going to be my answer. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, so, is the slush culture similar to this group, meaning the three of y'all? Um, do they have the same humor? <laughs> <laughs> Do they have yeah. the same humor? I, I, I think wow. so. If judging by the representatives that are on our Discord. Yeah, we uh, have a really great yeah. slush team, and they are super awesome to work with. And, um, yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're they're um, professional. But they're also very easygoing, easy to like. Uh, very skilled and um none of those adjectives apply to me <laughs> all right keep going i guess uh. all right um are there things going on now in the wider world that you'd be interested in seeing stories reflecting reacting to or commenting on oh man God, my initial reaction is like, no, I don't <laughs> want to see more. But I mean, I know if it was done really well, I'd be like, this story is perfect. Right. But it's like when you immediately say it, I'm like, no, let's I want to read slush that's going to not make me think about that. But I like I said, I know I know that. I will, and I have read stories in the slush that I am like, oh, man, that one hurts. Let's send it to Jason and let it hurt him for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, but I mean, that is how we got Sheree Renee Thomas's story. Well, when all said and done, I mean, uh, she was uh, writing and reflecting on some of the events that have been going on in the world, uh, which were vibing right with where my headspace was at, and... There we go. I have a question that is, what is the worst response you've ever gotten to a rejection letter? And what is the best response? I'm guessing... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So we can... All right, I'm just going to let you all answer the question. <laughs> I mean, the best response to a rejection is just not to respond. Um, it's, you know... You, you you don't need to respond. It's not expected. Um, the worst was when, well, I mean, there's been a few times where you get that snarky, well, it's already been picked up, accepted somewhere else already. And I'm like, mm, well, we don't accept simultaneous submissions. So how'd you do that? Um, but the worst is probably the time somebody told me that they were going to sue me for discrimination um, for rejecting their story. And I, yeah, so you get, I, you get some interesting emails <laughs> or I get some interesting emails. I don't know, Jason, do you get interesting emails or is it just me? <laughs> Since you do most of the rejecting, I you, do. I do most of yeah. the rejecting. But I do have um, one that I can share. This was back in the Apex Digest days, so between 06 and 09. Um, I, back then, you know, um, we still did mail submissions, although we did accept them through email. And so I had sent a rejection back to this fella. It was an awful story, and he wrote back this wonderful letter um, telling me he knows where I live. He can watch me walk my kid to the school bus. It was just crazy, and yeah, I, I was given advice to turn it in to, you know, local police in case he did something, but... I, I, I'd, I'd like to just give it no attention and hope that it would go away, you know, that this dude was just pissed off in the moment. 
piss off in the moment long enough to write a letter. Exactly. <laughs> like that's a long moment, Jason. You realize that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Write a letter, address it, find a stamp, go to the <laughs> mailbox. <laughs> Well, I'm like, well, if I go to the cops, well, I've got the letter, you know. Yeah. Um. <laughs> See, um, so, you know, I've mentioned that, you know, I, 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 it's hard to get stories to me. So there is that. I make it purposely hard for, you know, cause I would rather go hunt stories rather than stories find me. And yet, I do distinctly remember being at a convention being in the bathroom stall <laughs> and, and an envelope comes underneath the, the stall. I'm like, this is really, as far as submissions go, this is not the way. This is not the way. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> right. Someone asked a question that I'd like to answer real quick. Uh, why are you named Apex? That was the one oh. I was about to ask. Oh, okay. Have Sorry, saved, stepping on your thunder. Go ahead and... <laughs> <laughs> why are you named Apex? Oh, okay. <laughs> good question. Um, because I was looking for a uh, sign sounding name that started with a because i want to be listed towards the front of these like website aggregators for submissions that's entirely the reason oh man jason it's because we dine on the dream of, of writers and we are thus apex predators <laughs> what marie said <laughs> We should, yeah. Maurice has got the answers down. We will edit my response out and <laughs> it'll be cut for the later version. <laughs> All right. What is the thing you are most proud about, a I guess, from Apex? Seeing some of the writers that I've published, like, one of their first or second stories and seeing them go on to great success. That's always uh, a great feeling. Um, who was that? Was that a uh, Ferb? It's Ferb. Ferb not like my answer? Uh, Ferb heard your voice and has decided she wants to come try and find you apparently. Well, I'm Miss Ferb. She's a sweet kitty. Uh, other points of pride? Well, um, I was proud that we did 120 straight issues without missing a single issue. Uh, I know in small press that longevity and reliability are two things that don't happen very often. Uh, if it wasn't for my stupid jaw stuff that streak may still be intact so i'm happy to be starting a new streak with uh leslie and maurice leslie marie something we're particularly proud of um i mean every issue is just exciting to Especially this year, it's like every issue, as soon as Jason shows me like what the lineup's going to be, I'm like, this is the best issue. And then the next one he shows me and I'm like, no, this is the best issue. And, you know, eventually I'm going to have to be like, mm, the last one was better, <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think that that's pretty cool, though. I mean, it's awesome that every time I get just as excited for the lineup that comes out is the one before. Have I mentioned the two issues of Apex I edited? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> something beyond those two, please. Did you, did you edit something for us? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do you want to give out the issue numbers so we can easily look it up? Oh shoot. Uh, it's issue 120 
Oh, yes, because I remember, I distinctly remember issue 120 because Jason decided uh, it would be my fault that Apex shut down. But, uh, so that's he did put a big final issue right. on that cover. cover. <laughs> That's Reese it. Took Reese us out. the magazine. So that's <laughs> literally the only reason I remember that num that the issue number. Let's see what are other things I'm proud. Of? I'm really proud of Apex issue number two. It's a big <laughs> highlight for me. I'm trying to think. Was it Apex issue number six in the digest version? Also a big highlight. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going through my list of times I've been published What's in Apex. What's next question? <laughs> All right, let us pick one of these out of the fun one. What real life living creature terrifies you? You know, so they can go write stories about these things. <laughs> we were just talking about this in the um, the Apex Discord. I go hiking. Um, my husband and I hike occasionally and it's my thing is like I'm always afraid we're going to be in the middle of the woods where there's no people around and then I'm going to come across like a bear or a bobcat because we go usually we're in West Virginia when we're hiking um and yeah like I, I like them far away they don't terrify me far away but the idea of being alone in the woods on foot <laughs> And coming across them, especially sometimes when you're out there, places where the trails are sort of marked, not super well marked. So you're spending a lot of time like, are we just <laughs> going farther into the wilderness or are we actually heading back to our car? Um, so it, it, it's not necessarily the bear or the bobcat itself. It's the whole situation of being out and alone and not knowing exactly where you are, and then realizing, shit, I'm in their living room, like, this is my bad. <laughs> so. Yeah, pretty much co coincides with my general thoughts, which is all of nature is designed to kill you. <laughs> Thus, I take no pleasure in taking, like, hi, what are you doing right now, Leslie? <laughs> Hikes? <laughs> I do. Why? Because we go and we get a cabin and we see like no people. It's the whole social anxiety thing again. You put me someplace, there's no people. We have a cabin that, that's got a, you know, a TV and internet connection. So we watch movies and I read a lot of books and we go get lost in the woods. Is there air conditioning? Yeah. Not out in the woods. Mm. Mm. What does that tell you? You know what? There may not be air conditioning, but we usually go either in the spring or the fall. So it's not, and you can make a fire in the fireplace. It's just really nice. See, none of the words you said made any sense to me. Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> Maurice, you've not lived until you've walked like eight miles no, through the no, woods wrong. and seen zero wrong. people. Wrong, Leslie. You know how I've lived? <laughs> By not being exposed to nature. That's why I've managed to stay alive. No, it's 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 wonderful. It's one of those things. You're out there, and you're like, like if I fell off that rock and hit my head, that's it. No one's saving me. Wait, so how did that make it any off. better? That's supposed to be fun, right? That I'm like, fun. that feels not comforting at all. <laughs> I love it. I do. <laughs> all right, Jason. What creepy crawly are you in? You not fan of? Uh, just. Parasites in general, Ugh. they keep me from going into the woods. <laughs> Terrified of ticks and just so you know, my official and... answer was centipedes. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I hate. That's a good answer. I hate centipedes, but le parasites. Ugh. Which, Leslie, knowing this, mm. bought me a tick once thanks Leslie that was very sweet of you well every time I'm going out for a hike he's like watch out for ticks I'm like fine tick safety serious business <laughs> all right moving on to a little bit more of a serious question do you think 
lit mags, especially sci science fiction and fantasy ones, should do more for submissions from writers of non-Western backgrounds? Like targeted submissions, I'm guessing is what they mean. I think so, because the question, I mean, I just read the question how it was, but yes, I think, I think that's what it means. Um, okay, this is going to be kind of a strange, maybe a, a strange answer. If you're a magazine that has a very limited submissions window, then I would say yes. Like if you're only open for a month or a couple of weeks or a couple of weeks every few months, then yeah, it might be because what you're basically, you've got a submission window and like most places don't take multiple submissions. So if an author sends in a story, they're not going to have time to then in that window, send in another story. Um, and that I could see that it would be beneficial there because basically you're giving like a wider window to authors who maybe have been, are, are, less represented in the TOC. You know what I'm saying? Um, we're open 11 months out of the year. And I, I hope that authors feel like, I mean, as soon as they get a rejection, there's no throttling in ours. As soon as you, we pass, you are welcome to send in another story. Um, because we're open for so long, it's really hard unless we do and a special issue to then have a, a special submissions period for our marginalized writers because we're open 11 months a year to everybody. So if you've got 20 stories sitting there, you can churn through them. And I mean, hopefully you're getting hold notices and then I'm feel really bad because it takes me a while to get to you, but you know, hopefully you're, you can send them in back to back to back to back to back. There's no wait. Well, um, <clears throat> building on uh, Leslie's answer, I think there's something about, I think the word here is intentionality. And so I, I look at Apex, for example, which I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the, that the writer of the question is, is kind of saying, hey, what does Apex do? Um, but there's a matter of intentionality. So Apex has, for example, special editors whose job it is, is to go to different places and search out these stories, for example. Um, and it's not just me. I mean, Apex has enjoyed a reputation because of the stories we've published um, from international writers and non-Western writers uh, and, and, and the BIPOC community. You know, we, we do enjoy a certain reputation of inclusivity and, and not, but not a, a passive, hey, we're open, send us stuff. It's like, no, no, we're coming to you to, to search for these stories. Um, so we have editors that go out. We have uh, friends of Apex who go out and uh, stay open to, to story submissions and who recommend stories and say, hey, have you checked out this author? Hey, have you checked out that author? And so uh, with thus sending us after some of these authors. So, and we get requests all the time of, hey, you know, what about translations? You know, and I think we get these sort of requests because we enjoy reputation for being not just a welcoming space, but a space that is intentional about finding uh, finding authors and bringing them in. Yeah, I have had um, authors that we've worked closely with in the past who have sent me an email and been like, hey, just to let you know, this story is in your slush pile now, just to give me a heads up so that I even know that it's there because, you know, we get over a thousand stories a month. So it's nice to get that heads up from authors who we know and, and work with and trust to say, hey, this author, you're going to want to make sure you see this. So. Yeah, there are external and internal things the editors of these lit zines can do. And Maurice covered uh, the external side. You find uh, skilled and qualified people who can go out to these writing communities and kind of find the good stuff and make sure that they are being appropriately represented in our submissions pool. Uh, Maurice doesn't just go out and 
tell someone I want that story, he communicates to people that we want to hear from them specifically, uh, that we uh, want to be uh, as broad as possible when it comes to the um, individuals that we publish. Certainly, we do want to publish the best stuff, but that has not been a problem as the best stuff always comes from the broad selection of writers. So um, that means everyone will get represented. That means we're publishing stories from point of views that are different from a lot of the stuff that you may already be reading. And on the internal side, you can instruct your slush team to be on the lookout for work from marginalized people uh, that may um, uh, may need just a little more work, but because you, as an editor, you're wanting to make sure that you're giving voice to a broad range of people that you may uh, be willing to put in a little more work to bring that piece up to uh, publish material. Um, uh, anything else? <laughs> I mean, Leslie and Maurice said it all so well. I'm basically rehashing. <laughs> what, well, what we had a question come in um, that goes back to uh, the nature hikes. Um, and people want to know um, what Maurice and Jason do that are not hiking for fun, recreationally. Why do people want to know this? I think that the conversation was so much fun. Um, like, you're, you're, like, telling Leslie that, you know, you're like, no, I stay indoors. Which, me, personally, I'm, behind, I'm with you 101%. My mom was far too much in nature of this whole thing. But... I, th I think they want to know, like, what do you do for, for fun then? I write. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fun. And I, you know what? This is crazy because uh, we actually had a big broadest family meeting about my writing habits uh, because I had to I had to go do a trip. Uh, and, and so part of the trip was I got sent to this hotel. It was a beachside hotel. And my wife was like, are you even going to go outside and enjoy the beach? And I'm just, so I end up taking a picture of me by the beach, with the beach in the background. And I'm like, is this close enough? And she was like, yeah, these things are wasted on you. And I'm like, that's, that's fair. That's fair. I'm just here to write. That is literally what I love doing. I love writing and I love community work. And so if, if I'm not doing those two things, I'm like, oh. I mean, I, I suppose in theory, there is a beauty to nature to be observed. I understand this as an intellectual idea. Behind like glass. For, oh, thank you, exactly. It can be observed yeah. safely. Or a really nice screened in porch if the weather is perfect. See, I, I see. Just, look, I just did that the other day. I experienced nature through a series of screens. I could smell <laughs> it and everything. That, it was a thing. And see, I'm the type that I'm like, hey, Jason, I'm going to be gone for the next two days because I'm taking my Girl Scouts camping to go kayaking. And he's like, isn't it like 98 degrees? And I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. See, oh, see, that's the other thing. Like, my, So I, I have a wife and I have two children. And like last year, they all decided they wanted to go uh, jump out of a perfectly fine functioning airplane. And I'm like, why would you do this? It's now, that I'm not into, but... I'll go kayaking and zip lining and I'd like to say Leslie, that's not any better. I know in your head you thought that sounded different. It, it's not. It is. It doesn't involve going in a plane and jumping out. It it sounded a lot like I'm going to throw myself into a river and hope I live. That's what I heard. And I'm taking other people's children with me. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> frankly, you're a monster. That's that's just Sorry. <laughs> My Girl Scouts love me. All right. They love me. <laughs> Jason? 
Jason. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he I'll listens to Maurice and I bicker for fun. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I goof off online. I'm 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 an interesting guy, you know. <laughs> I do stuff. All the stuff. All, all <laughs> the stuff. All the stuff. I, I get bored and harass my friends over text messages. That's something I like to do. Everyone's shaking their head, yeah. And I'm going, I can't answer you. I'm in the middle of the... <laughs> I have no cell service. No service. <laughs> See, that, now you guys wonder why I go to the world. <laughs> right? right? All of a sudden, there's a, a certain amount of sense to it. <laughs> okay. I like how this question is worded. How do you feel about Flash? Genius or get off my porch? How do you feel about what? Flash, as in flash fiction. Ah. I'll be honest, I love flash fiction, especially when it's amazing. Like, when it's amazing, it is amazing. And you're just like, yes, but it's very hard to do. Like, I am in awe of those writers who can send in a story, a flash piece that is just, that just blows my mind. Yeah, I'm with you. I love flash fiction. But I so rarely encounter any where I'm just like, oh, God, that's amazing. Oh, it's hard to do. It's really do. hard, yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, considering my snap judgment, you know, if I'm going 250 words in, I mean, that's that's most of the story. I'm, I'm basically committed at that point. <laughs> You'll read the last hundred words. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um... Do you see Do you see yourselves as artists? You mean as editors or as a writer? I see that it doesn't specify because I know obviously I know a writer. I know Jason is a writer. Leslie, well, I I don't to be a, I, I will say that so as a writer, yes, I consider myself an artist. But as an editor, your job as an editor isn't that different from that as a curator anyway. And there is an art to curation, frankly. Um, uh, I, in fact, I will I will give an example of a, a case of editorial uh, adultery, as a, you know, I'll put it that way. Because I, I did a guest issue of Fireside Magazine, for example. And uh, and, and so so uh, when I was the guest editor for for the magazine, so my father had just passed away. Um, right when I was doing the, the guest editing spin. And uh, and so I, I went and selected my stories and everything and, and, and put together the issue and then set it aside like I'm prone to doing, you know, and then came at it, you know, uh, uh, again with fresh eyes. And I realized I had chosen a series of stories that was processing grief. And uh, and and basically the stories actually take you on a whole journey of 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 grief, processing grief, and then what does it look like to pivot in your grief to start to be able to dream again? That's literally the theme of the issue. That's curation on one level, but it's also I mean there is something artistic to that, right? So as you so yeah I'm 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 still doing art I'm still being an artist and I'm it's just now I'm painting not just with my words I'm painting with other people's words. Ooh, I, ooh, I like that answer. I'm, yeah, I'll, we should write it down. Right. Oh, we're recording, so you'll have right. it. <laughs> there, there we go. Yeah, that, um, and the follow-up question to that was, um, I'm going to word it a little bit different. Um, so when issues come out, um, like me, Maurice was talking about curating, um, is there, a, is there um, an emo emotion or theme to each issue? And and does it reflect what you would like to see either changed in the world or to better our society in a way? Or when I'm constructing an issue, I do consider thematic elements of all the stories that we have in our inventory um 
granted there are there have been a few times where our inventory was limited and i just had to pick you know six stories that i felt worked best together but often um there is an overarching statement with everything that is included in the issue at least from the fiction point of view jason selects the final my, my job is just to, to bump all the best stories up to him so that he can then do his his work <laughs> all right i have a question for marie um in the snap judgment panel, both Jason and Leslie, Leslie mentions that secondary world fantasy wasn't in their world, wheelhouse. How does Maurice feel about it? Secondary world fantasy? I love secondary world fantasy. Don't tell Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I love what I love. I mean, I also love, like I said, I also love talking animal stories. So, I mean, so these stories are going to speak to me in a different way. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I'm still passing them up and then, uh, you know, let Jason be the final arbiter. But I'm, I, for me, it's going to be secondary world stories that, you know, do they have the apex, apex aesthetic? Do they have the apex sensibilities? And if, and if they do, you know, I'll pass them up. But I mean, I I love secondary world stories, so there's that. You know, we did say that, but we do publish quite a lot of quite a lot secondary world fantasy work. So I just was saying that oh, here it's we harder for me to sometimes get into those stories. So I do feel like I'm not as quick to snap judgment them. Because I re recognize as a reader, that's not what I'm drawn to. So I feel like that I, because I know that about myself, I'm afraid that my bias will make me snap too fast. So I tend to read farther. I can't wait for all the cover letters to now begin. Hey, can we shunt this story to Maurice <laughs> rather than Leslie? <laughs> I imagine after this, you'll get a lot of emails that is like, hey... I have a talking animal story. Right. I'm going to flip it to you under this email wall of the bathroom stall. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I'm going over what we have left of the questions I've skipped around. Um, what, what book on your personal bookshelf is the most worn and well-read? I'm going to, I'll go ahead and answer. I probably would say We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. I absolutely adore that book. And I love the way that every time I read it, I feel like it reveals something new. There's some new aspect that I didn't consider um, that I can get all excited about. And then I want to immediately after I finish it, I want to read it again because I'm like, ooh, well, now I need to be thinking about that from the beginning rather than figuring it out towards the end. So yeah, I love that book and I have read it many, many, many times. So I will say, let's see, N.K. Jemison's Broken Earth Trilogy, as well as her how long till Black Future Month? I end up buying repeated copies of all of the. Oh, speaking of repeated copies, also Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. I tend to buy a lot of copies of those because I read them and then force them upon other people. So, because they must love them as much as I. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else is up there. Though those are probably my my big go to things that that are not comic books. I'll say that that are not comic books. Well, I'm going to use comic book. <laughs> uh, I'm big uh, Sandman. I've read that many times. Many I've read the entire run probably a half dozen. Oh, no, it's more than a half dozen times. Uh, so Sandman, Watchmen is a repeated one. I do a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, what else? I've start, I'm starting Saga again. Um, cause I, I fell in love with saga. So, yeah, so those are, those are big ones also. So. 
Okay. Um, we can we can use we can, we're getting to the point where we can use more questions. So if you have anything else to ask, please send us more questions. Yeah. Um, after a hard day of rejecting, what is your favorite <laughs> snack? <laughs> hard day rejecting. <laughs> uh, this is Leslie, the rejectionator. I know. And I don't even, I, I actually don't eat a whole lot of snacks. So I'm, I, I guess Greek yogurt and frozen berries. I mean, <laughs> I honestly don't eat a whole lot of snacks. By the end of the day, I'm like, all right, it's time for dinner. Eat trail mix and. No. <laughs> No trail mix. Uh, after I'm exhausted from sending out rejection notices and breaking hearts, I like to indulge in a big old pint of uh, chocolate ice cream. Marie? What was the question again? Your favorite snack. Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Anything with alcohol. That's a liquid snack? I don't know if it counts. Well, I know, I was going to say, I do, at the end of the day, if it's been really hard, I do like to have a, 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 a glass of wine, but it's not really a snack, and I don't break into it at the end of the work day. I wait till a little <laughs> bit later. <laughs> It's not like 4.30 and I'm like pouring myself a glass of wine. Which is like an hour after working with me, like 11 a.m. 11 a.m. I'm like, it's shark day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we dipped into talking about graphic novels a tiny bit. Um, what are some recommendations you y'all would give to readers? Well, if you're not easily offended, Preacher is a heck of a lot of fun. Preacher is fun. <laughs> Y'all went straight to Preacher. <laughs> I don't read a whole lot of graphic novel and comics. Um, I've read The Walking Dead. Um, Uzumaki is really good, but that's manga, so... Mm. I don't even know where I'd begin. I mean, yeah, Saga is a recent, a recent discover, a recent love. Um... But I'm also a big grant. I say I tend to collect comic books. Well, I don't collect anymore, even though apparently a lot of my friends are trying to get me back in by starting to write them. Uh, and so, uh, but like I, I used to collect by writers. And so like I was a big Grant Morrison fan. So, well, I am a big Grant Morrison fan. So uh, Animal Man. Oh, man, his Justice League run. Anyway, I, I'd be all over the place. But Sandman. Uh, lots of Alan Moore stuff. Uh, Watchmen, Miracle Man. Um, oh, goodness. I could do this all day. I'm going to stop. Uh, I would love to have a Q&A where I just ask you your thoughts on Alan Moore stuff. Oh, I could do that Q&A, just so you know. <laughs> I, I am here for that Q&A. Well, it's not tonight, but I, I would like to do that. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> Jason? Oh, um, I think The Watchmen is seminal reading for any <coughs> writer. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking of seminal runs. So I was like Christopher Priest on Black Panther, Peter David on The Incredible Hulk. These are like some of the most, those are like seminal runs on comics. All right, I'm done. I'm done. No, you, uh, this question is in your wheelhouse because I don't I, read a lot of graphic novels either i'm not in my my office apparently has bad wi-fi or, or else i'd still be in there and i would like i'm surrounded at that point by like twenty thousand comic books because that's how many i got before i quit collecting because i was my wife apparently was all finicky she's like you can either keep collecting comic books or we could feed the kids and i guess that was a decision i had to make so i had to stop like twenty thousand. it was made for you it was made for me yeah that was true when you're editing a story, how do you view the balance between voice and clarity? Oh, voice and clarity. 
I lean heavily into what the author wants. And if what they want ends up being just uh, something that I think is too obscure, obtuse, um, too hard to parse for a reader, then, you know, then I'll have to evaluate what will happen then. Um, can't say I've ever really had that big a disagreement with writers, though. Um, most professional writers and, well, not professional, but most writers in general want their work to be enjoyed and understood. So they are usually pretty open to suggestions when it comes to clarity versus voice. Yeah. Yeah, I've never seen it as an either or. Because um, they're doing their job, they're going to be clear. Um, and so, but I'm also a huge fan of, so that said, I'm a huge fan of voice. So I'm always going to lean into, uh, voice mm -hmm. over most, most things. Um, what kind of nonfiction are you interested in getting? Where's Clarence? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was like, Clarence needs to answer this one. Uh, okay. I'm going to attempt to answer based on the pieces that he has turned into me. He likes stuff that has a very unique voice and addresses important social questions from a creator's point of view. Yeah, which sounds like the exact sort of thing I would look for in nonfiction. So, so the next question... Um... I guess is asking um, when y'all are writing, do you approach it theme first, character first, or plot first? That's a good question. Hmm. It's been a long time since I've written, so I just want to finish something at this point again. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've written. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I'm spending all my time in the woods and reading. Right, okay. Right. <clears throat> Dunking kids in cold streams. So I, I finished three stories this week. And uh, and each one start from, st start from a different spot. Depends on what, what the how the story's speaking to me. Like the one started with me with a character. Um, and actually, I take that back. Just two of them started with the characters. The characters spoke very clearly to me in my head. So there was that. But then the other one was all about plot. Um, but which is interesting that those two things happen because most of the time I actually start from the world building perspective. I usually start with the world and then that, that's usually what generates the story. So it was interesting that it was, a uh, and plot's usually my weakest area. And so it was interesting that a story spoke to me th and I went to a story through plot versus the other two through, uh, the characters themselves. So it depends. Yeah, I agree. It depends on... Sometimes you come up with this great character. Sometimes you want to address a theme. Sometimes you're like, hey, I came up with this great setting. I want to write something in that world. So, You think speculative poetry might come back, but I don't... I'm guessing they mean for Apex, because I, I don't think it went anywhere. Yeah, this is my comment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the hard truth is... is um, Looking at like site numbers on stuff, this was back when we were publishing poetry on the regular. The poetry would get one third to one fourth the amount of reads as the fiction and nonfiction. And it just was the, the time that we were spending looking for the poetry and editing it and paying our poultry editor it just the, the financials just didn't make sense i uh absolutely adore good sci poetry and it's a horror po poetry it's always probably my favorite in the genre um but until it makes more economic sense or perhaps maybe next year we can if we have to do another kickstarter we can do uh stretch goal of having poetry.
Well, we are officially about done with questions. Um, so if anybody has one more left that they want to pop in, let me know. Um, I'm also out of drink, so y'all better make it quick. <laughs> <laughs> He's sorry to snap judgment, y'all. <laughs> exactly. Popeye's out of his spinach, so let's wrap it up. So, um, thank you guys for letting me do this. Thanks for well, doing it for us. Yeah, it was thank great. you. You've been great. I hope, I hope to everybody watching um, that y'all have enjoyed our Q&A special. Is it a special? Yeah, apparently it's an annual thing, which was news to me. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a calendar, Maurice, next year. Yeah, you know what? Let's make that a stretch goal. That's a stretch goal for next year. If y'all make it to a certain amount, only then will I agree to do this thing. <laughs> I it's a will... personal stretch goal for us. Oh, I see. I will agree to do things like this. Jason X surprised. He was like, really? And I'm like, of course. Yes. Of course. <laughs> so I like these. These are fun. For the people watching, they should go out and check out Beth's, Beth Dawkins' work on apex-magazine.com. She's got some great work out there. I'm in this issue, right? I'm in this issue. Yeah, you're in, you're in 124. Yep, yeah. yeah. and and the the other one was with Maurice. Uh, it was the um, I I, I want to use a word that's not the word. Huh? Yeah. It was the preview issue for. Before, the last uh, time I could be published in Apex. We were published together then. Well, we were published together, so there's ah. that. Um, just a quick reminder, everyone, we are running a Kickstarter to uh, finance all the issues in 2022. So far, four of the six have been um, paid for. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully, we can get those last two locked in. And then after that, maybe we can fit in um, an Asian and Pacific Islanders issue. Um, next month, uh, we have issue 125 coming out. And in October, I'm very excited about this. From last year's Kickstarter, uh, one of the stretch goals was an Indigenous Futurist bonus issue. And that issue comes out in October. Um, guest editor Allison Mills has turned in all the fiction and I started the process of reading through that and editing and I think everyone is going to be quite pleased um, by the quality of the work that she has put together. And thank you Beth for hosting and Leslie for giving an, yet another hour and a half of her time and thank you Maurice I guess. Oh, you know what? As a reminder, Maurice has two books coming out next year. Uh, okay. I have a, a, a middle grade detective novel coming out in April, and I have a science fiction space opera coming out in March called Sweep of Stars. So there you That's go. Beautiful that, title. Thank you. I, I write things. <laughs> I look forward to that one. <laughs> not the kid one so much, but but yeah, I'm not so, target audience. Right. <laughs> Beth, do you want to wrap it up and sign us off? I will. Um, thank you again for watching. Um, have uh, what is the strange? The strange. What is the tagline? Apex tagline. The strange. Dark and strange, surreal, beautiful. Yeah. Real and beautiful night. Thank you again for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Q and A with the Apex Magazine editors. Remember, you can check out the Apex Magazine Kickstarter until August 18th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Eastern. We'll see you soon with more fiction. Theme music by Alex White. This podcast is copyright 2021 under Apex Publications. Please visit www.apex-magazine.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.